Welcome to Open Source Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name is Alvon. I'm Abby. And we're your host. Every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, JOS. This is episode 15, and today we're chatting with Herminio Vasquez and Virginie Grossboyle about their paper, Quali, a Python package for data quality checks across multiple data crane APIs. Herminio is the Director of Data Strategy and Analytics at Cupado, and Virginie is a postdoctoral researcher. I thought this was a great conversation of a passion project or something that they both really care about and both really put a lot of heart into. It was great to hear them their experience building it. Solving a problem that Virginie faced in her work and Herminia too. And yeah, the passion, as you say, for what they're doing was infectious. So I really loved the hear them talk about their work. Also, I think it was our second project where it turns out the people who published in Josh were, I think, a couple, right? Yes. So this is our second time now. So this is there's a selection function here that I'm not aware of, but that we appear to have. No, it was great. I thought the, the origin story was really good. Also, I think timing wise, there seems to be a number of things in Josh that people hacked on a lot during COVID, right? So I think people yes. had a lot of time to work at home. So maybe that's the selection function. That's so you probably got couples it. working yeah. on software at home together. Oh man, I, I couldn't work on software with my husband. I think I'd get too frustrated, but it's fine. I'm right. just questioning my life choices now. I didn't write any software during the pandemic. What was I doing? Never mind. Anyway, but yeah, it was good. I thought we, mm-hmm. we learned a bit about bacteriophages, which is mm-hmm. really interesting. So there we go. Yeah. So should we jump in? Yeah, let's play the interview. Herminia, Virginie, welcome to podcast. Thanks for joining us today. You're thank welcome. you very thank much you. for inviting I'm so excited to have you both here. Yeah. We're so excited to be here. <laughs> nice. So we're here to talk about Quali, I think I'm saying that right, which turned out is a riff on quality, I think. So we're going to be talking about some software that helps people measure and maintain quality. So tell us about the project. What is it? What does Quali do? And maybe a bit about your background and how you ended up working on this. So first, Quali stands for good. It's a Nahuatl words and we use it because of course it reminds of quality and quality is good for our data. So Quali it's a Python library that helps the users to implement checks for his data and is platform agnostic so it can be used for a very different type of data frame and it's also very fast. I think more and more data is becoming more to convey information or to make decisions for whatever reasons or political reasons. And and therefore anybody that is willing to trust more or to have that support on what you are presenting or making your decision on, I think that's probably one of the biggest inspirations for quality that both Virginia and myself had to put our names into reports, had to be in front of people making decisions uh, to grant money or to do things that have transcendental implications. And and therefore we thought, okay, if our name is going to be on it, we better trust this. So that's the inception moment for building something that can help us to develop confidence about what we are presenting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And can you tell us a bit about your backgrounds and what brought you here? Well, I started my career on software engineering on nuclear energy. So um, then probably perhaps spent half of my professional career doing quality modeling and testing. I think I've traveled around 30 lost countries just doing implementations of quality and, um, and projects. And then the other half of my life, I've been more working very close to, to data. So I was first the bad guy to say, this is not going to work. And I kind of got tired of being that bad guy. At some point, this concept of big data emerged, and then a lot of projects started to take on the idea of using data for more than just testing systems, like large scale systems, financial systems, etc. So my background is on engineering, but especially on statistics, on, on algorithm development, and, and, and now, yeah, I pretty much work on the industry. So on my side, I am a bioengineer or biotechnologies by training. So then I did a PhD in microbiology, so not so much related to data. But during my PhD, I get confronted to a large amount of data and more and more bioinformatics. And it's how I started to get into data and quality of the data. So now I do way more bioinformatics and I build software for my, my project. So it's where data become 
important and also quality become important. And so is this software that you use in your research today, Virginia? Can you say a little bit about the work that you're doing today and how you're handling data in that sort of bioinformatics domain? My current project is about bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. So the project I have, I work with a particular type of prophages that have a very large genome for prophage, and they are prophage, so they are integrated inside the bacterial genome. So, and we are trying to find out how those prophage affect the behavior of their host or manipulate their host. So I work with a lot of um, genetic data or sequence data. And um, one part of my project is to compare different genomes of those prophages to find what genes are common, what genes are unique to each of them. And one of the things is I use gen bank files that are usually uh, used to store data about genomes and annotation, what the genes are, where the genes, what they do, what kind of protein they have. And one of the big challenges with those files is that the information are not always in the right place or not always the right information. So the way I use Quali is to see what are the anomalies into those files and see where my pipeline could fail and why it could fail with certain of the sequence. Interesting. We have done hackathons together and, and she's, let's say, the face of the academia and I'm the face of the industry or let's say the professional side. And, and I've always said to my consultants or my teams, do you really want to learn operating or doing data engineering or data science? Do bioengineering. I mean, dealing with these live things that die or having to gather information from microscopes, from all these devices, from lab. I mean, these annotations, there are people that are still doing a lot of manual entry and writing in notes and things like that. So yeah. it's a real challenge. There's all these error prone type of activities are just surfacing or, or into data issues. Um, but I mean, there is no single day that Virginia said like, oh yeah, I cannot find genes. They put proteins or things like that. So it's really fun. Yeah. Lots of human processes going on in a lab, right? There's lots of yeah, possible sources of errors there. Yeah. And I think both Arvin and I have forayed into bioinformatics and we've seen how messy that kind of data can be. And there's entire people, their job is just to wrangle data. So yeah. I understand. But I was going to say, fun fact, in the, where I worked one time, a load of sequencing runs and alignment runs didn't run one night and nobody could figure out why. And it was because somebody had turned off somebody's computer that was under a desk. And it turned out they were all being orchestrated from somebody's desktop because even though they were being run on a big cluster, the cron job was on the... Well, you have to... took, I think it took a good few weeks to figure that out. We just couldn't, we were like, what, where, how does this thing ever work? Anyway. So lots of scar tissue from that. I was going to ask about these bacteriophages. From my understanding, there's lots of quite unusual genes there, right? Like they're genetically very special or unusual compared to sort of other species, right? Do you try and hold a whole genome in a data frame or is it just pieces of like, what's the thing that actually you're loading up and then using quali on? Actually, yes, the full genome. And those prophages I'm working with are quite large. Usually prophages are around 40 kilobase pair. Okay. And the one I'm working with are like 130 kilobase pair. So they are very large. Yes. So I'm loading the genes. And one thing also that is very interesting for us is to find out what those genes does. Because if you look at the annotation of those prophages, 70% is unknown. So there is still a lot of work to do. <laughs> cool. And so it sounds like there's a pretty diverse range of uses for Quali from genomic data to, Arminio, you mentioned some industry data. Do you have a target audience for this or an audience that has found really good uses for this? I'll give a, a different spin now from the prophages and it probably is, it speaks about where Quali was born or the idea. I was in a project on an asset manager and we paid six ciphers on data that we consume from different sources. And, and it happens that data that we received that we were paying for, it was not with the quality that we were expecting. And that tr troubled us. So somehow we, we said, okay, we are paying a vendor for high quality data and we are receiving something that is not high quality data. So what do we do? Essentially it was with this idea as well of trying to test 
big some big amount of data. And I think that was where Wally was born. I was trying to use another library and I, I can quote it because they were literally the inspiration, PyDQ. It's another paper developed by AWS and very interesting. It has different capabilities, but it was not compatible with the software that we were using. And it was literally costing us three to five more times in computing power to run the same quality checks for the amount of data that we have. So we have a very business oriented decision to make. <laughs> and idea was to make sure that we could simplify execution and, and especially oriented to time series, not just to biological checks, but defining anomalies on completeness, uniqueness, uh, imputation strategies on, on different that different types of data sets. And that was part of the inception there. The need of not having a framework that could help to run these checks in kind of commodity hardware without having to pay an extra, let's say, zero on your cloud bills just because the, uh, the framework required a lot of compute. Right. I have some experience of working with data engineering teams and making that leap to actually testing data is a really big and important one. And so I didn't know if you know about Quali. I was going to ask about alternatives in a second, because I think some of the related projects that are similar that you benchmark against are ones I, I'm aware of and have great expectations I knew about already. But that testing of data, it, it pr proves to be really valuable for, for us. At GitHub, in my day job, we were responsible for building the core metrics pipelines that run the business. So how many people used GitHub yesterday? What was our revenue last month? Things that people are staring at a dashboard making business decisions. And usually we catch the errors in the dashboard. So you catch it far too late, right? Whereas actually when you start testing, you realize this team that says they're giving you this perfect snapshot, you're like, what you gave us yesterday was junk. Yeah. It's all zeros. And if you then run that through for 48 hours and build a number, you catch it way too late. So that sort of mental model of testing data is, I think, a really valuable one for, for teams have to learn through hard work and chasing their tail when they find errors right at the end of the line. But I can ask, what, what are some sort of alternatives or areas of inspiration? I think you mentioned uh, great expectations. I think there is Soda, there is PyDQ. What else? There is Pandera, Pandera, there is, I mean, we're getting to know what is out there because of the community in GitHub. So people actually, we have a pull request open now. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm migrating from Pandera. I'm loving this by the way, but it will miss these features. So I, I guess there is, there is a lot of people switching platforms. I think now every successful IT strategy don't see just how to get in, but how to quickly get out. So I think that's probably the reason as well of this, um, when comparing some of the frameworks or the solutions there are, it, it's pretty much following this lockdown of like you write it there and, and, and then you have to stick there and then wait for long development cycles or support. And I think the, it's comparing with the other frameworks. There is also another aspect that I would like to highlight. And that was that there is this idea of citizen science or citizen engineering that you can write everything in YAML or that it kind of simplifies the way that, that you don't have to write anything and quality is more oriented to like, no, you really need to know how to write this check. And so it is, it's kind of the questions that, that you ask to your data, what will help you to save your back when you are, and the framework is just going to do as good as you would define these quality checks and, and the industry help with that. So what we see also in other frameworks is that the background of those are not ISTQB or the International Software Testing Qualification Board or the Data Management Body of Knowledge, they are just more ad hoc programming oriented, but they are not using the fundamental blocks of, I don't know, orthogonal arrays or pairwise testing or doing something that has been researched as the mechanism to increase your probabilities to reduce defects. And I would say it's a combination of those, the organic growth, that this is a non-profit or a more ad hoc uh, academic cross industry type of project against other projects that perhaps are more towards commercialization or, capi or cap capital or, 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 yeah, with different interests, I would say. That's what we also see. Right. And looking at your GitHub repo, I see the summary that you have there is possibly the fastest data frame agnostic quality check library in town, which is really fun. But I also was really impressed in your paper. You have a little benchmarks table and it shows just how fast Quali is. 
what makes it so fast compared to the others? Uh, it was a big discussion, and I think this was part of a lot of breakfast writing on the windows and design, but I think what makes it so fast is the modularization plus the simplification of the rule engine. Typically, you will rely on you defining the rules, but it will not be with the heuristics or the good practice, as, as we mentioned. And the other one is that with modern processing or computing engines, you can do vectorization of, of the computation or also multiple instructions at once. If we learn a little bit of things from even from CPUs, you will see that a lot of things today are also done in the exact same way. So we are just literally copying part of the architecture of single instruction, multiple data, but mm -hmm. applying those concepts into a computational science, which is let's try to do or compute as much in one instruction as opposed to trying to do things sequentially or trying to do compromises. Piggybacking to the other question about other frameworks, mm -hmm. what we see is that we don't sample bad data, other frameworks do. We define predicates so that it's based on the user to say, I would like to know what is wrong, but what makes it fast is that we are not trying to, in the quality process, do a lot of things. We just want to let you know it is okay or it is not okay. And that is just like a production line, right? Um, the, the, the simplification of that process of quality is what, what makes it very fast on the, the fact that we are running all the checks at once. That makes a lot of sense. Sounds like performance is a real focus for you. It seems like it's paying off. Bro. I wanted to talk a little bit more about data quality and maybe Virginia, I was curious about sort of data quality and reliability, producibility is a big word in academia that gets used a lot. I just wondered how you sort of see the state of your field or of the areas you work in. Is this a thing people care a lot about? Are you a good example of what everyone else is doing? Or do, do you think you're doing something different from your peers here? Okay, that's a tough question. As you probably may know, uh, in my field, we still do a lot of things manually. I mean, we have a lot of lab work and most of the time we just recollect the data, um, you know, whatever we observe in the lab and manually and we fill up, I don't know, an Excel sheet with all the data. And usually it's how those data are transferred from one person to the second person in the team and, you know, worked on. So most of the things are still done manually. However, in academia, since a few years now, data have become more important. For example, you can see it at the grant level. Nowadays, when you want to apply for a grant, they actually ask you about uh, data management. What is your data strategy for your project? How are you going to plan to store your data to make sure that they are trustable, to make sure that you can share them and all those things. So now you even have a specific part in the application where you need to describe all your data strategy. But I think data have become more relevant in academia, even if maybe in the day-to-day -day it's still not always, you know, set up. However, I think it's pushing to that. And also in this FAIR framework, you know, when your data need to be findable, they need to be, you need to be able to share them, to trace them. So this has become more important. I think it's also a challenge. When I see the amount of work and knowledge that you need to have to perform just the analysis of the pages and understand that these things live and die, that there is a, an increase in temperature will mess up your entire experiment. And then on top of that, you really need to be good at data because all the things that you are presenting are based on the information that you are collecting. So it's a very tough challenge. Yeah, no, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement in lots of fields, right? So I think one of the things that Joss does as a journal is sort of a selection function on finding researchers who are investing in software and tooling and investing in that process for, for whatever reason. It's a, usually a pretty common theme amongst people who published in the journal. We were happy to be selected because I was saying always with Jenny that projects always compromise between the scope, money, time, and quality. And somehow after being in the field for so many years, you can see that quality sometimes is always the, the one that steals at the very end. It was like you compromise development, functionality, all, all the areas that are more relevant and then quality kind of 
it's an afterthought or it, it is left to the end. Ideally, we, what we were trying to, to do is make it accessible, simple, fast, adaptable, so that you can bring those processes early in your work or, and that can also help improve as a byproduct of the quality that you invest in. So it's trying to switch the mind of building quality in as opposed to testing quality out. Yeah, it's much easier to react to things when they're going in than trying to figure something out much later. Well, something that I've been hearing a lot more about, with, especially with AI, is bias in data. And when I think about reliability and trustworthiness, I definitely think about bias. Is this something you're thinking about at all with Quali or with your work in general? I mean, you could use also those checks to test bias in your data. But uh, I think for bias, it mainly depends how, how you design your checks and what question you ask about your data. In my field, for example, is mostly if whatever sample or data I'm looking at are uh, representative what I'm looking at and if it's not, you know, something I selected because it's what I know and then it just fit a set and criteria, but not really represent the population. And about the um, trustworthiness, it's also where the data come from. I mean, as we mentioned just before, in my field is a lot of manual input. I mean, if I come back to my GenBank file, sometimes you find really weird annotation like you will have a bacteria or virus and the source organism will be a plant, uh, mammals, which make no sense. But I think it just means that is how you interpret, you know, what you are to put in. So I think there it also helps to catch out those things. Sometimes the checks are very simple. I mean, when you're doing statistics, I, I, you know that you will run a chi-square test to help you identify the sample it's representative or there is a statistical significance to do what you're trying to do. But, but these kind of things, again, it's just verifying a standard deviation or doing just a small test to verify that what you have is an output. I think the, the more complex thing is more about lineage and provenance of data mm -hmm. and understanding the end-to-end, -end, say, pr process that touch the, the data, right? I think there is now e even ISO standards that check that, like, okay, we, we will have to see fingerprints of everything like a mark of check of where the origin of the data is so that we can understand if we can trust it. Right. Now that makes sense. My takeaway from here is that researchers or developers need to be quite familiar with their data in order to write the correct tests and the correct checks to use quality properly to, to figure out the reliability and trustworthiness. There are other things, I would say, especially for scientists or engineers that are important. I'm thinking, for instance, classification tests, right? You will have to check the entropy of a particular column, or if you have to check, I don't know, variance or standard deviation thresholds will help you to, to understand, okay, we can dismiss this column. It doesn't bring any information to my model. And those are probably just out of the box things that you can uh, discriminate very easily with a check, right? To say, okay, there is no variance or zero information gain, adios. So these kind of things. But again, it very much depends on how familiar you are with the problem that you're trying to solve and what kind of things you are doing in order to simplify it. Oh, that makes sense. So I was curious to ask, obviously, Quali is an open source project. I was curious what your backgrounds are in open source software. Is this just one of many open source packages that you both released? Is the first one you've released? I'm just curious to hear what your origin stories of, of each of you are in this open source world. Well, it's the first one I released. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have been a lot of open source libraries, so I do like them and I really like their, you know, this project, this community project where a lot of people just bring things they want to see in the library and help to develop it. In biology, we have this BioPython library that is a very big community library and I find those projects very interesting because it, it's useful for everyone that will work with this type of data. Personal thing that there is... Rarely you will find an, an organization that can compete with, with community developed software. I mean, they literally have like 5,000 developers at your disposal just by smiling. Yeah. And, and I think that's going to be very hard. And also, Virginia always tells me, you, you want to work in an area where people care, work with open things or in science because people really put their heart on it. Um, and there is no about the money or it's more about the pride or the community building or the idea of working together or solving a problem together. So I think to, 
to me, rather than just growing a community or building in the open, it's like we have both benefit a lot from the open source community. And we think that's a way forward for at least our values are to share what we know and probably for the next person it's going to be better or simpler or, um, yeah, get a little bit of legacy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I love it. How many are curious about you know, yourself and the first open source package you worked on? Well, I have broader ones that uh, didn't have as much impact as quality. I think uh, the fact that we did this together also, it makes it special because it, I cannot tell you how many times we were discussing in the kitchen about the modularity or just mm -hmm. how to test it. I remember Virginia just telling me, how are we going to test this? And she started to write her own cases. And anyway, it was just fun to see. And coming back to the question, it, it's a fun project to work with. It's something that helped us to, um, yeah, to get to know more about how we think. We were very polarized, but it was really nice. I like the idea of sharing. I think that I like the concept of building something and suddenly seeing it uh, picking up and now, I, I don't know, we feel pr pride and we're proud of the repo taking momentum and, I don't know, 10,000 or 12,000 downloads a month. And, and even when it's small, it's important for us because we know that we are helping somebody else to do quality and, and that's important. It's lovely. Beautiful. Yeah, and you mentioned how with open source, you put your heart into it. And I think I read that in the Joss review. I think, Arminia, you left a comment near the end when it was published saying like, oh yeah, Virginia and I really put our heart into this. And <laughs> I... That was one of the reasons I was like, I want to interview them. Let's get them on the podcast. I want to hear their story about these people who care so much about the software that they write something like that. So it's great to see that was a big motivation behind this project. And it's it's clear in what's come out of it uh, that it's something you both put a lot of thought and care into. Yes, we did invest in yeah. our windows. We were living in the Netherlands. I think COVID has to do also with the fact that uh, we were yeah. at home. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, um but yeah, it was very nice, especially that aspect of, I wanted it to be fast. Virginia wanted it to, make, to be testable and somehow we were forsage. <laughs> but yeah, at the end, we make it simple and testable and fast. So we are really happy about the outcome. Oh, that's great. So what other challenges have you run into while building the software? It sounds like trying to make it both fast and testable was a big one. Any other big ones come to mind? <laughs> and the design. <laughs> You want to talk about it? No. <laughs> I mean, building a house is difficult because you know that every head is a different world. So what appeals to Virginia probably doesn't appeal to me. You reflect also part of your personality. How do you think? How do you do things? So I, I guess when you are designing something, it's also how do you put yourself in it? So there were a lot of discussion about how we do things so that things don't break. I always make a silly analogy about this, the spacecraft that it's some space, something suddenly doesn't work. And then somebody will have to just pull one area of that spacecraft out and the remaining will carry on working. So I think one of the challenges is that data platforms are growing. Now we have other libraries, DocDB, Polars, we have uh, BigQuery, we have different technology stacks taking the stage of the data industry and keeping up. It's going to be really hard. And so we have to do it in a way where implementing other data frame APIs, it's simple and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to literally extend or expand the software. So I guess making it, I think there is a thread in LinkedIn when people were saying, wow, you can do all these things in 3000 lines of code and it's super cool. And I could read it uh, in five lines. So that was also, I guess, uh, for us a testament that, okay, people are liking it because it's simple, because there's not a lot of code because it doesn't have any dependencies, you install it and then you are good to go. It's not that you bring baggage of 100 libraries to make your work. So I guess the challenges is we know that we are not going to carry on doing it together. And the challenge is how do we make it attractive for the community so that they feel empowered to continue and grow the community more and do even more with, with it or implement it. So we'll be very lucky also that people, we are already contributors in the repo that made really a big contribution just to carry on expanding the, the coverage of the different data frames and, and platforms available. So this is a project that sounds like it's getting some momentum uh, with the community as well, which is really exciting. I was curious if there are particular areas where you're looking for contributions from the community. Are there are things you're especially 
would need help with? And if so, what skills do people need to make meaningful contributions to quality? I think it's not so much about what we need for the project. I think it's more about how people are going to use it. So the major contribution we have at the moment are people that either want to implement another platform, not a type of data frame, or people that have specific use cases. And in this case, they will also help in implementing uh, those new things into their already existing um, platforms. We don't have a prescribed roadmap. I think the project has grown organically based on the contributions and on the evolution of the data platforms. We had initially a set of needs mm -hmm. and we will carry on working in that, that regard. I think the ones that are coming are the biochecks for Virginia. I think we, <laughs> we put this ISO or the, the standards for me. <laughs> But I think the ISO branch is the one that, that hopefully is going to help delivering on those hackathons to make sure that the genes are not uh, labeled as proteins and that mm -hmm. the sequences are actually sequences and that the structure of the files are actually structures. So anyway, so I, I do think that, that we rely a lot in the community and make it accessible and, and not just putting egos on the comment, but more about, you know, how can people contribute, just make them feel that they can make uh, something for them and and in the same way, help somebody else uh, resolve the problem. So I, I guess that's sticking to this community building idea of I help you, you help somebody else. And that, that probably might be the, the thing that we are advocating for. So it sounds like though, there's really obvious ways to contribute, which is if somebody builds a new platform with another type of data frame, like that compatibility piece, but also new scenarios for testing. So it sounds like there's some really clear contribution opportunities here, which is always exciting to hear. There is guidelines as well. I think no. Virginia <laughs> was very punctual on, okay, this is how it needs to be. <laughs> this is the bare bone or the structures. And now you just need to adhere to this. <laughs> it's literally nice. like, okay, this is the plug. You just need to plug it right here with two arrows. <laughs> like this is the way. So I, I would assume that now people are contributing because they are seeing feasible, easy to just implement the structure and then suddenly seeing, oh, magically it does the work. No, that's great. Having those clear contribution guidelines and clear instructions, I think really helps people jump in. So good work, Virginie. I approve. <laughs> yeah. Cool. But this has been an amazing conversation. So how can people follow what's happening with Quali online or follow both of you? Mainly on the repository. Follow the discussion. There's a lot of discussion going on. I even welcome on the project. And I hope that people are going to come visit the repository and try it out for the ones that haven't tried it yet. I think being on a small project right now compared to the commercial versions of it, mm -hmm. I think people that are struggling, I would say, is probably the, the, the ones that are landing into quality because they are finding difficult to, to run their checks in other platforms or it, it just doesn't do it for the amount of data that they are trying to, to do it. Right, that makes sense. And can people follow you individually? I mean, we are not the big, well, I'm not the social media and right. he literally hates it. I mean, she's just politely not answering. <laughs> Ask because you both put your LinkedIn's in the four. So I assumed you'd want your LinkedIn's linked there. Yeah, I guess, I mean, yeah, I, like, this is the place to <laughs> like things for, but yeah, agree with other colleagues. But I also am not uh, super big in, into those platforms, but we understand that's probably a way to reach out to more contributions. So. Yeah, LinkedIn probably would be the best, uh, at least for the LinkedIn and the repo. Yes, exactly. Okay. Sounds great. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. It's been great yeah, to hear about Quali and your work and just your experience building it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed the, the conversation. And, uh, yeah, very nice to, to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community-run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support Joss, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to Joss. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-U-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arfin Smith and me, Abby Kubunak-Mace. Edited by Abby and music CC by Box Cat Games.